Just say when. Yep. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this particular talk. I'm going to introduce Jeff Kaiser real quick. Jeff Kaiser made his fortune as a, uh, in the rough and tumble CD underground world of Soviet and Russian business. From 1974 to 1986 and between 91 and 2002, he worked in leading positions at Vnestorg Bank. Since November 21st, 2002, he has been the chairman of the management committee of Gazprom Bank. Since 2003, he's also been deputy chairman of its board of directors. He's here today to talk to you about hacking some Asus wireless routers. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Kaiser. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. <laughs> so uh, I guess first I'm um, going to talk about a little thing, some, some things that you may already know a little bit about. Um, and if you're not here for the wireless router talk, you can politely leave and I won't get offended. But uh, let's see if this works. Yeah, so, so first of all, I want to talk a little bit about why you would want to hack your wireless router. And actually, before I even do that, has anyone here ever hacked a wireless router? I don't care what kind. Cool. Awesome. And maybe somebody can just shout out, like, why, why did you do it? Like, what was your reason for hacking your wireless router? Are you making a NASA probe or, like, what were you doing? Like, anybody? You were what? Oh, awesome. That's, that's, super, that's pretty creative. I was expecting. Um, something more along the line of like, I wanted a wireless router that was better than the wireless router that I bought, because I feel like that's probably most people, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so chances are, um, if you did hack a wireless router, it was probably this one, right? Like, I'm sure that people at least know what this is. Um, this is the Linksys WRT54G, super famous, right? Like, everyone's probably had one of these or knows somebody that has one. Um, I have at least two of them. One of them somebody gave to me. Like, they, they didn't want it anymore, and so they gave it. So, like, they're everywhere, and they've been around for a really long time. Um, they were introduced in 2002, and if you think about that, you can still buy something that looks almost exactly like this now, and it's 2009. And they were introduced in 2002. In PC terms, that's like a lifetime. And yet, we're still using basically the exact same hardware. Maybe it was made a little bit cheaper, you know, a, li a little bit better, but probably not really, because actually they just took the cost out. So you're actually getting less for your money, but hopefully you're paying less. Um, there's been a lot of different hardware variations of this. Um, there's been versions that have half the flash. Everybody hates those. They run VXWorks. You can't run Linux on them. Um, that's a real pain in the butt. Um, but fortunately, the original firmware was released in 2003 under GPL. Um, a little while after that, uh, some open source firmwares were kind of released into the wild. And that's where this router really took off, was because it got widely hacked. People were using it to set up mesh networks. I think Meraki originally was using this for their mesh network, uh, which is in a few cities in the country. Um, people have used these for crazy stuff. Like, people have used these as robotics platforms. Somebody put, like, CDs on the side, and it rolls around and does stuff. Um, so there's like things that are not router related too. Um, and I actually I just looked at Wikipedia, and there are 31 third-party uh, firmware packages available, which is nuts. Like, like this router has been hacked to death, pretty much. So uh, everyone who's been hacking wireless routers at least knows what this is, um, and it's been going on for a, a pretty long time. Uh, Life Hacker in 2006. This is whenever I found out about this router. Uh, ran a story, turned your $60 router into a $600 router. So people are taking. Uh, routers that have pretty simple, like the Asus firmware was not great, and so people were flashing it. So, you know, the first thing they would do is they'd install DDWRT or Tomato or whatever. Um, they'd boost the Wi-Fi transmit power, right? You know, just like any Wi-Fi issues you have, just boost the transmit power, everything starts working, you know, everybody's happy. And that was probably the number one reason why people originally installed these firmware is because they just want to jack up transmit power so they can get out to the garage or whatever. Um, and then, you know, people started doing more interesting things like playing with uh, dynamic DNS on the router so you're, you don't have to have a server to do that. Um, doing hotspots, you know, a lot of hotspots and cafes and stuff are using these with um, packages like DDWRT or Tomato to basically limit access and, and you know, even some paper use stuff like uh, VPN. You can get DDWRT has a VPN option now that you can get so you can run VPN into the router. You don't have to have a separate Linux PC to do it. Um, so all sorts of things. Now, let's see. Yeah, so, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, 
But like, why are we here? Because that's like to me, that's cool stuff, but it's not really the reason why I would want to hack a wireless router. Um, so I started thinking um, about a, a few months or about a year ago that a wireless router is cool um, because it's actually much more than just a, a wireless router. Like, if you think about it more in terms of it being a small, low-power PC, then it's a little more interesting. Because if you think about what you have, you've got a fairly small package, you've got a 200 megahertz CPU, which is, you know, good, not great. Uh, you have a few megs of RAM, you've got a generally very small amount of flash, but enough to do some very compact Linux distributions if you start thinking about it. Um, you generally have some I.O. Um, almost all of them have a serial port that you can access somewhere on the printed circuit board. Uh, sometimes you have to add it. Sometimes it's like broken out to a header for you. Um, and the coolest thing is that they run on five volts, which you can get almost anywhere. You can get that in a car. You can get it on your rooftop. Like, if beyond like power over Ethernet and, and fancy stuff like that, just like having something that's very small, consumes less than five watts, which is pretty darn good, uh, runs Linux. It's like a tiny computer. So maybe instead of using this thing as a wireless router, um, we can actually use it as like an embedded computer. And if you look at this, these are some embedded computers are out there. Like an embedded computer, for anybody who's not familiar, is basically a computer that's um, dedicated to a specific function or like a set of functions that's made to be put into some equipment or like used for something specific. Like your washing machine has an embedded computer. Now it's not really a PC, but it's an embedded processor. Um, people pay big money for these. And like these are cheap ones, actually. You can see the Bug Labs um, has gotten a lot of press recently. And they're like 200, let me see if this works. They're like 250 bucks, which is a lot. I mean, for just hacking around and kind of goofing off and having fun, um, that's kind of a lot of money. Like, whenever I started playing with these, there was no way in heck I was going to spend 250 bucks to start playing with embedded Linux and playing with these routers. Um, the Beagle board has gotten a lot of press uh, recently. It's got a 600 megahertz processor, which is pretty awesome. Uh, if anybody who hasn't seen the Beagle board, it's like this big. I mean, it's this tiny little circuit board. It's got a ton of RAM and a ton of flash. And that actually, like dollar per performance or performance per dollar, that's probably by far the best out of anything that's out there. Like, I'm really excited about the Beagle board. Um, I just went to a class on it. It was super inspiring. So if you haven't ever heard of the Beagle board and you want to do something that requires DSP and video, like this has DVI output, like spend the $150, like go to beagleboard.org and like learn about it. It's just amazing. Um, on a little bit cheaper, there's the gum sticks, which are these little tiny like gum stick sized uh, PCs, or, or sorry, embedded computers. Um, those have been probably on hack a day. Like they've been around for kind of a while now. Um, but if you look at it, these are all like sub significantly over $100. Um, I wanted something that was like way less than that, like less than $50. And if you think about it, your wireless router, like generally you can get wireless routers for under $50. Like sometimes some of the nicer ones are 60 or 70 bucks. But um, I've gotten routers for as little as $20. So like say you, you, you're willing to wait, you're, you're, you know, you're going to wait until the Christmas season or whenever the manufacturers are doing mail-in rebates, like you can cut this $50 even in half if you do it right, you know, or you could go used or whatever. So basically, compared to all these other kind of fancy embedded systems that people use to make cool stuff, like car pewters or whatever, um, your wireless router is readily available. Um, it's got some power. It's Performance-wise, it's much lower. But then again, maybe you don't need that for what you're doing. So it's a good thing to think about. Um, so I like this one. And actually, I brought it. So that's this guy, which I've taken apart. But basically, this is the Asus uh, WL520GU. And you can see it's pretty small, actually. It's, let me put the cover back on. It's pretty tiny as far as routers go. It's definitely smaller than the WRT54G, which is cool. Um, so yeah, it's this guy. And he's tiny. It's, I actually picked it partially because of its size. Um, and this is a fairly new router, actually. It was introduced in 2007. Um, it's got one external antenna, unlike the WRT54. The cool thing is that Linksys is totally cheaped out, and their antennas are not removable anymore. Um, this one actually is still the RP SMA, and it comes off. So you could easily remote mount this, which is cool. Like, Linksys kind of jacked us, and they made it so that the antennas are permanently soldered to the printed circuit board. Um, which I didn't appreciate. So it's kind of nice that Asus is still spending the little extra money to do that. Um, they're often super cheap. Like, I actually bought one of these for $23 after mail-in rebate. And Asus actually does send you the mail-in rebates. So don't be too afraid. You have to be a little bit afraid. But I've actually gotten you know, all the money Asus has ever owed me. So you can get these things very, very cheap. 
And to be able to get something like this for 20 bucks is pretty remarkable, I think. Like whenever I saw that, I realized that this is something that's worth at least looking at, like to use in a project. Um, and the one thing that's maybe the most significant of all is that it has USB. And that's maybe the one failing of the WRT54G is that it does not have USB that totally limits your options because USB is awesome. <laughs> like USB is one of those things that as soon as you have a USB interface, there's tons of stuff you can do. You can do USB audio, USB storage, you can put a thumb drive on this thing. You can do USB to serial, like say you need 10 serial ports. Like if you can make that work for you driver-wise, which you probably can, you can do it because you can put a hub on this, you can put as many USB devices as you want. Like there, there are some cases where things won't work entirely the way you want them to, but generally my experience has been most USB things that I plug in, if they have Linux support, have worked, which is really stellar. So that opens up like the hacking possibility for this router is way bigger than the WRT54 because now you can glom on this huge range of peripherals, which I think is really significant. So you say, yeah, that's cool, but you know, great Jeff. So, so what am I gonna do with it? So, so here are some examples. Um, this is a standalone weather station that Hal made. Um, I have his web address there. Um, he actually did this right whenever I started hacking this router. I posted this on my blog. Um, and he actually took a WL520, which is shown kind of down in the bottom, maybe not the greatest photo, but basically here's the router. Um, he used the serial port of the router to actually connect to um, a little AVR circuit. AVR is a microcontroller. A lot of people are hacking AVRs these days. Um, basically, serial link from the router goes to the microcontroller. And he has the router over Wi-Fi um, query weather underground. And if it's going to be warmer tomorrow than it is today, the LED shown here turns more red. And if it's going to be colder tomorrow than it is today, the LED turns blue. So it's like, it's really simple, but it's cool. It didn't cost a lot to put together. And it's based around the fact that this router is super easy to hack. You have full Linux, so you can do, you know, Wi-Fi, you can query, you get web queries, you get all the Unix shell commands. So, like, you can mash up applications super fast and easy just by taking this hardware, which you can get pretty cheap, and then glomming on other stuff, like the AVR. And, you know, maybe you're not into AVRs, maybe you're into something else like an Arduino. So, you know, a lot of people are playing with Arduinos these days. Um, this I liked, actually, mostly because of the case mod. <laughs> There's this awesome, like, backlit LCD display with white text that I think is really cool. And uh, uh, this is by uh, Chris Miller. He basically hacked this LCD display into the router. Uh, he also has some, I think these are buttons on top of the router. Um, and he's kind of mid-project, but basically what he did is he took an Arduino Pro, which is a smaller, compact version of an Arduino, um, and put it into the case. Um, does anyone here not know what Arduino is? Like, Ar so Arduino is basically a little circuit board that's uh, a platform for, um, they call it physical computing. It's like interfacing sensors with your computer. So it's this little cheap $30 circuit board. It, it, you should definitely check out Arduino too. If you're thinking about doing any projects that involve like measuring temperatures or like doing things with the outside world, Arduino is a really good way to do it. Um, this one I just found out about pretty recently. So this is basically wireless router, connects to a Wi-Fi network. Um, it has a USB memory stick, uh, 256 megs that basically has all the stuff that won't fit on the flash of the router, including uh, PHP and Magpy RSS. Um, and it actually has an Arduino as well, a different version of the Arduino. And then it has this really cool LED matrix. And basically what this does is it queries RSS feeds on the internet and then it prints them on the LED matrix. And I actually have a video of it. So just really, really cool stuff. So will it work? Yes. So this shows the display actually working. So you can see here's Gizmodo, basically streaming on the uh, LED display. And all the components here are super cheap, like, like the routers under 50 bucks. Um, these are $15 at Sure Electronics. You can get these cool LED displays and they have a serial interface that's talking to the Arduino. The Arduino, this is a cheap version of an Arduino, which I think is like $15 on a breadboard. So if you're interested in doing like electronics kind of hacking and you know putting things together and doing things without having to know a lot about microcontrollers and like microprocessors and you know there's no assembly language programming there's nothing you know too crazy in here you can put cool like mashup applications like this together you could totally do a version of this for Twitter you know you could do it very easily um, this is the Tweetawatt and um, the Tweetawatt has been on the news a bit I think it was on like Nightline or something like that. 
Um, Lamore Freed, or Lady Ada from Adafruit Industries, put this together. And uh, the kilowatt is a, a power monitoring device. So you plug the kilowatt into the wall, you put your hair dryer or your refrigerator or whatever into it, and it measures the amount of power that you're using. On the little LCD display, you see the LCD on the top of the kilowatt, uh, which is cool, except that there's only so many things you can do with just one of these measuring one appliance. So what she did is she actually put uh, what's called an XB module inside the kilowatt. And so what that does is it broadcasts over a mesh network back to a central node that collects data from a whole bunch of these. So she can put one on every outlet in her apartment, and she can measure the power being used by every appliance, every computer, everything, every, everything that she's got. Um, but the thing was that, I mean, it was cool that she had this system, but she was running it back to a PC, and the theme of this was saving energy. So having a PC to function as the data collection um, was kind of wasteful. So she used a, a wireless router. Uh, here's an XB module that's on top um, that networks to all the kilowatts and basically um, collects the data and then serves it up on a web server. It uses Python and serves it up on a web server on the router. So I actually included a video of her talking about it. Yeah, the video is- A couple of months ago, I worked on a project called the Tweetawatt. It's a project where I took this kilowatt meter, say uh, off the shelf $20 power meter from Home Depot, and I upgraded it to include a wireless XB modem. This is a Zigbee a wireless transceiver. And that project works pretty well, but one of the questions people keep asking is, well, by default, you know, you show that you need to have a computer on. The computer receives that data and sends it to Twitter. That's the tweeting part. But, you know, isn't that kind of silly to have a power meter that's on all the time? Like, wouldn't it be good if it was a low power system? So I'm going to show how I actually do this at home, which is I got this um, $40 Asus wireless router, and this is the wireless router we use um, in the apartment. And I've upgraded it by adding a XP modem, just like the one in the kilowatt. And this one has a nice big antenna so it can, you know, receive transmissions from all over the place. And these indicator LEDs show when it's on and receiving data. And basically I just um, upgraded this uh, router with OpenWRT, uh, according to uh, MightyOM's excellent instructions. And then just soldered in a little header and it goes straight to the XP, um, this talk serial. And it's a serial port, so it was pretty easy to get around. So, so basically, you can actually, if you go to her site, you can watch the whole video. Um, she basically talks about how she put it together. And uh, her blog has great instructions. If you want to build one of these, just go over to her site. She sells kits of the XBs and stuff. So you can actually monitor the power usage in your apartment or home, whatever. Um, and that's something that's very recent, just came out uh, a few weeks ago. And the Tweetawatt actually won the Greener Gadgets competition this year. So it's a pretty big, big deal. Um, this is something that I've been working on. This is my project. Um, I had a vision uh, last year that I wanted to build an internet radio. Um, and I know you can buy these, and actually increasingly now you can get them and they're somewhat affordable. At the time I was looking, they were still at least two, three hundred dollars to get a streaming radio. And I wanted it to, to listen to shoutcast streams, so I didn't want any weird, funky player interface that would keep me from being able to do that. So I decided to build my own. And that's when I started looking at these wireless routers whenever I wanted to put this project together because I realized that if you have a wireless router and it's got a decent CPU, you don't need a, I mean, we were playing MP3s whenever we had Pentium 75s, right? So like, you don't need a huge amount of horsepower to listen to MP3s, especially if they're not, you know, crazy bit rates. Um, most shoutcasts is 128K or, you know, whatever. Um, so I thought, I take this router, it's got a decent amount of uh, uh, CPU power, it's got enough RAM, it's got hopefully enough flash. Um, I put on a USB to audio converter, uh, $7, you know, this really cheapy thing here, plug that into the router, um, and then I, I actually went even further and I added some extra parts. Um, so this is the router, it's running OpenWRT, open which is a Linux distribution. Um, down here I've got uh, uh, SparkFun LCD display, which tells me what song is playing. Um, and then I have an AVR microcontroller here talking over serial to the router. Uh, that's in control of changing stations and showing me, you know, the artist and title of the current track and stuff like that. You can do a lot of things. I just did what was easy and kind of simple. Um, and I have a video of this working. So this, I'm changing a tuning control, and the tuning control is changing Relish stations. It's just a knob. So, so as I rotate the knob, it tells the router, okay, go to the next station, and I just have a bunch of streams loaded. So it's just stepping through the streams one, at, one after another. Yeah, and then the LCD display, you can see, is 
years digitally imported, is basically just updating to show the stream name and the artist and title of the current track. So basically the router, there it is, it's playing streaming audio over the internet over Wi-Fi. It's um, sending the audio through a USB to audio converter that saved me having to do any work at all because I just stuck the USB to audio into the router. It just works. Like there's just no work at all. The Linux drivers take care of everything. So you can do stuff like that without really having to do a huge amount of work because other people have already done the work for you. The OpenWRT guys have already done all the hard work of porting Linux to this little router. And so you can just like within a, a weekend, you could have this working. Like there's no reason why within a weekend you couldn't have something like that without the LCD display and stuff, but you could have it playing music. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about actually hacking the router. Um, so, so this is the router, and I showed it to you here. It's this guy. Um, pretty standard, like not super interesting. Everybody knows what they look like at this level pretty much. You know, it's got ethernet ports on the back. Here's the USB port, uh, power input, antenna, you know, whatever. So if you wanna hack it, step one, void the warranty. Um, two of the screws are hidden under the feet, which irritates me. Um, one of them, I think this one has the warranty void if removed sticker actually in the, the, the hole for the screw. So they're like a little bit crafty about it, but just rip that out, you know. In my opinion, like if it's under $50, just like break it, like who cares? You know, just buy another one if you break it. Please don't send it back to Asus and say like, I screwed up my router because I misflashed it with this guy's uh, firmware. Uh, I won't be happy about that. Um, but you know, just buy it. The minute you do this, I mean, figure that it's gone. And if you're lucky, you'll get it working. If not, just throw it away and buy another one. Um, so this is with the cover off, and uh, the cover just unclips super easy. And so if you take the cover off, basically you get this. Um, and if you take if you take the PCB out, which actually comes out super easy as well, you get this. And you can see it's small. You know, this is really sexy. It's just really it's what four by six inches basically. You could totally stick this into all sorts of things. Like this will definitely fit under your car seat or you know, in another case for something else. Um, so on the PCB, um, I'm an electrical engineer so I have to like look at these things. Um, you've got the SRAM, uh, you've got the, the Broadcom CPU is in the center. This actually includes the Wi-Fi functions inside of it. So there's no discrete like Wi-Fi transceiver. It's just all in this one mega CPU that includes everything in there. Um, and then this is the flash. And I actually had somebody recently post to my blog saying, I think you can increase the RAM capacity um, just by desoldering the RAM and putting on another SRAM. So you can do crazy stuff like that. I actually haven't messed with it because for me it's been good enough just the way that it is. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff on here. Uh, the CPU runs on 3.3 volts. So the five volts comes in here. There's a step down converter that goes to 3.3. Most of the router runs on 3.3 volts, including the serial port, which is actually pretty important to know that whenever you're trying to talk to it. It's a 3.3 volt serial port. It's not RS-232, it's 3.3 volts. Um, and then this is the RF section. You can actually see, if you look at the board, you can see like the, the trace snakes up and goes the antenna. It's really cool just to look at it. Um, this is the bottom of the board, which is less interesting. Um, there's actually an internal antenna on the printed circuit board, which I thought was pretty cool. I think that's for diversity to receive. I don't know if that's a transmit antenna. Um, you can see the bottom of the USB port. You could actually remove the USB jack if you wanted to and like move it somewhere else. This is the bottom of the, the serial port also. Um, so the first thing that you have to do if you're gonna hack this is you have to add a serial port. And there's actually two reasons for this. Um, the first is that flashing routers blind sucks. Like flashing using TFTP, and then like waiting for it to program. And some instructions say go away for five minutes and like, you know, just hope that it works. Because the, da the danger is that if you half flash an image to a router, you can actually brick it, right? You can actually break it to the point where it won't boot. You need JTAG or something like that to fix it. I don't even know that this router has a JTAG port. I haven't found it. No one's posted anything about it. Um, so that's reason one. So you're not working blind. And, and I'm not a big fan of that. So I, the first thing I did whenever I got this was I found the serial port on the printed circuit board. Um, I added a serial port so I could actually see what was going on in the router. Um, the second reason is that the serial port's actually useful. You know, you can talk to the router using a lot of like low, low tech things using serial. Not everything is USB. So like my AVR microcontroller that does my LCD display on the radio, that's over serial just because it's easy. You know, why mess with anything that you don't have to? It's already there and it works. It's good for simple things. Um, so to actually do that, you need a couple things. Um, the first thing you need is one of these FTDI 
uh, USB to serial cables. You could use other things also. The important thing is just to make sure it goes USB in to 3.3 volts serial out. Not everything is 3.3 volts. If you take 5 volts, you might blow up the router. Um, I've heard people have had it work, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, you definitely don't want to use RS-232, you know, plus or minus 12 volts for RS-232 is just definitely going to blow up the router. Um, you need some of this header strip, which you can get. There's a lot of companies that would love to sell you this stuff, like SparkFun. Um, I'm sure some people have heard of SparkFun. They sell all sorts of cool stuff um, for doing electronics, you know, playing with electronics. But you can actually, you can't find this at Radio Shack, unfortunately, because Radio Shack sucks. Um, but you can find it at pretty much any electronics store. So, like, if you have a local store, if you don't have a local electronics store, um, I would definitely go to um, probably SparkFun first, because DigiKey is going to have 5,000 of these, and you won't know which the right one is to choose. Um, SparkFun is, is really great. So you're looking for some 0.1 inch header. That's what actually pokes into the printed circuit board for the serial board. Um, and then you definitely need a soldering iron. And you need to have some basic soldering competency. I've seen on my blog a couple people have ruined their routers by not doing the serial port. And honestly, I don't know what's going wrong, but if you bridge one of the traces to an adjacent you know, ground or something on the board, I guess the router doesn't like that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I haven't broken one, but then again, I've been soldering for a long time. Um, I'm, I'm like half tempted to start soldering these for people, but I don't know that I really want to get into that. Um, so this is what the circuit board on the router looks like before you add the serial port. You know, conveniently, uh, there it is. It's, you know, four pins all in a row. Uh, they must use these at the factory or like when prototyping or something, because otherwise they wouldn't have made it so easy for us. Because all you have to do is you just solder in that header, little four pin strip of header. You just you have to you have to get rid of the solder in the hole. You stick the thing through and you solder it, and you know, ta-da, you have a serial port. Um, and then I actually made this little adapter board here that mates my USB to serial cable to the pins on the board. What you could do if you're if you're cheap or you just are in a hurry, um, just pull the pins out of the cable and rearrange them in this connector to be the right pinout on the board. And the pinout's on my website, mightyohm.com. Um, it, it's up to you. I was using this cable for also some Arduino stuff, so I didn't want to like be messing with the pins. Probably forget where they're supposed to go. Um, so then the next thing to do is uh, uh, install OpenWRT. And OpenWRT is uh, basically a Linux distribution for embedded devices. You know, great. Um, but actually, the, the interesting thing about OpenWRT compared to DDWRT or Tomato or you know whatever your favorite Linux distribution for your WRT 54G is is that the, the reason OpenWRT was created and its kind of design philosophy is that it's to use the device in ways never envisioned. That's awesome. You know, that's like exactly why I'm playing with these, right? I don't want to use these as wireless routers. You know, you can do that. And actually, while I was playing with the radio, making the Wi-Fi radio, I, it turns out that like all the stuff to use this as an access point is just in there. It just boots that way. So like I used to, to provide internet to my laptop, I just plug into one of the LAN ports of the router. So like it's running my you know, streaming radio, but then it's also actually an access point. It's got ethernet ports on the back. So it runs all this other stuff that's kind of wireless router E. Um, normally it doesn't come with a web interface, although there is one now. I, I think it's like uh, Lua, I, I can't remember what it is, but basically there's a web interface that you can get for it. Um, so, so the important thing though is that OpenWRT is totally Flexible. It's just made so you can do whatever you want. Um, and actually, to that goal, or to that end, um, it's got some cool features. It comes with BusyBox. Um, for anyone who hasn't heard of BusyBox, it's basically like a, a shell replacement that includes a lot of common Unix commands in it. It's just a single binary. It's got you know, all your standard cat, echo, you know, whatever. It's got you know, ash and all that stuff. It's, it's basically, it's a port of the, I think, the Debian ash shell. So it's got a bunch of different cool shell commands. Um, it has a package manager called OPackage. Um, that lets you very easily install third-party packages as well as like kernel modules and stuff without having to totally recompile your, your firmware image, um, which is good. It saves a lot of work. There's a lot of third-party packages available. Um, like for my Wi-Fi radio, someone has ported MPC and MPD. So for the Wi-Fi radio, I just run MPD. It's like, it's done. I hardly, I just had to make a, a shell script to wrap around MPD and MPC to do connect to a stream, start downloading music, you know, fast uh, change streams and things like that. It's all done. Like you don't have to create all that from scratch, um, which for me was great because I just wanted it to work. I just wanted to to get something that was working very quickly. Um, there's also this um, 
it, they claim it's a streamlined, like easy to use cross compilation environment for porting things from one, you know, from your desktop to run on the router. Um, in my experience, it's, it's there. For someone like me who's, like I can compile my own kernel, no problem, but once you get me into like 30 page long make files, I start to get a little queasy. Um, I had a hard time with it, but I actually did get it to work. So I have ported stuff to the router. It's just, for me, it was a little bit of a pain. For people who are more comfortable with Linux, it should be no problem at all. Um, the WL520 is supported, obviously. That's what I'm using. Um, the only problem is that the 2.4 kernel works. Um, some people have said that there's some USB 2.0 issues with the 2.4 kernel. I haven't actually messed with USB 2.0. I just said, okay, fine, there's issues. I'm not going to use it. For USB to audio, you don't need it. For mass storage, if you're content with you know, USB 1.1 speeds, you don't need USB 2.0. Feel free to play with it and let me know what you find. The, the bigger deal, though, is that the 2.6 kernel is listed as a work in progress. Apparently, the issue is that the WL520 uses a Broadcom wireless chipset, and um, it has a, uh, what, a compiled driver that's only for Linux 2.4. And so um, there's guys who are working on the B43 wireless driver to get Broadcom Wi-Fi working in Linux 2.6. Unfortunately, um, I think maybe like that's changing every day. Like they're getting closer every day. But at the time that I checked, there were still issues. So um, if you want to run the 2.6 kernel on this, I, please like try get it working and then let me know what to do. Um, because I just I haven't needed it, but yet I know that for a lot of people the 2.4 kernel is kind of a deal breaker because they want better USB support. They want you know, all the fancy stuff with 2.6. Um, I guess for me, like my needs were pretty simple. So I made the 2.4 kernel actually work. Um, yeah, so, so actually at this point, my slides got kind of dry. Um, and I decided that instead of going through a bunch of slides where I give you shell commands uh, and tell you how to build this, I'll actually flash the router here and show you that within, you know, ho hopefully less than half an hour, assuming that clock is correct, I can have it actually doing things. I thought that would be better. Um, so that, of course, hinges on the fact that I can actually get everything working, but I think I can. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to quit out of the presentation and let me show you, let me just get rid of this. Um, let me show you basically what I have up here. So I have the router, and you guys are welcome to you know, come find me later and I can show it to you up close. It's kind of cool just to look at like what people are doing whenever they manufacture these. There's all sorts of cool stuff on this printed circuit board. Um, the antenna, which I'm going to install. Um, I've got a power adapter for it, which is actually down, plugged into the power strip. I won't show you that. Um, but the important things are, this is the USB to serial cable here. So this is USB on one end, A connector. And then it's got that little little printed circuit board that I made. So basically all I do for that is I just plug that into the laptop here. Um, and then I plug that into the header on the wireless router. You're welcome to take a look at this later. So that's that. That's super easy to do. Um, and then the other thing I'm going to do is I have an Ethernet cable, Cat5, uh, connected up to the laptop. And then I'm just going to connect that to one of the ports on the router. Um, and then. I just apply power. So hopefully this works. Um, I should be able to go over here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start up a terminal program. And yeah, so basically this is what's happening on the serial console of the router right now. And right now it's got the stock 520 firmware installed. Um, so basically you see it's going through various boot routines, you know, all sorts of stuff on here. Um, it's interesting to actually capture this and look at it because you can kind of see what ASUS is running on the router, which is kind of interesting just to, to kind of figure out how they're doing things. Um, so if this works, what I should be able to do is basically open up a web browser and I should be able to point it at the router. Yeah, so um, the root password is admin admin, printed on the bottom of the router. And there it is. So this is the router as you would buy it from Newegg or wherever, um, running the stock firmware. And you know, it's complaining about various things. But 
this is basically, whenever you get it from the store, this is pretty much what it's going to look like. So we don't want this. This is terrible. You know, this is not going to work for what we want. So if you want to actually reflash the router, all you have to do is just hold down the reset button. I removed power, hold down reset, plug in power again, keep holding reset. Now meanwhile, over here, a little bit of acrobatics. Um, yeah, you should see something like this. So this is the serial console looking at the router, and it's actually looking for uh, TFTP. So it's saying, give me a firmware image. Um, and so we're going to do just that. So I've got basically here on my laptop, I have OpenWRT. I've got some images that I can flash to it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of these, start up TFTP, connect to the router. This is over the Ethernet cable that I've got here. Uh, I always forget to do binary. And so I'm going to put the image over. And you can see TFTP sending it. And then also, um, sorry, now it's stopped complaining. It's not updating anymore. But once TFTP finishes, you see that the image has transferred to the router. And it's actually flashing the router with that image. This is the point where if you didn't have the serial cable, you wouldn't know what was going on. So you could actually unplug it while it's flashing, which can potentially be a bad thing. So the cool thing is, because we have the serial connection, we can actually see what's happening on the router, which is, which is super helpful. And it actually does take a second to program. It's basically programming a basic OpenWRT image onto the router, and it's done. So once it finishes, you just power cycle the router. And now you should see slightly different boot images. And they actually look largely the same to the stock firmware, but this is OpenWRT working now. Um, you see it says detected 520GU. Um, you can see there's a whole bunch of messages. It actually has to format the flash. You see WL520GU is actually detected by OpenWRT. Um, it's doing stuff. You know, it's setting up USB, setting up Ethernet. And then it actually it, it pauses here for a second because it's going to get to the point where um, it's actually formatting uh, flash. So, so far so good. And if you're lucky, yeah, here it goes. So now it's erasing flash, which takes a second, but it should be done with this. OK, cool. So it's done formatting flash. So now all we have to do is on the serial terminal, we push Enter. And ta-da, you know, so there's OpenWRT is now installed on the router. Um, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot that you can do just straight off um, without in installing third-party packages. So the first thing we're going to do, I actually have a web server running on my, my MacBook. And uh, I'm just going to tell the router to look at the MacBook for um, images. So let's go here. I set up a um, just static IP. It doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, no. We're just pointing this at my laptop, and hopefully I got that right. OK, so if that worked, yeah. So basically, I told the router to update its list of packages from the laptop, which it just did. Um, so now what I want to do is um, install some stuff. And what I'm installing is a USB driver, OHCI mode USB driver. Let's install USB to audio. Let's install USB to storage. And let's install a file system driver uh, for FAT. So you just go O package install, all the different packages. So it's actually fetching these from the laptop, and it's downloading them onto the router. You see, it's pretty snappy. Um, you can also connect over the network. So like on my website, I've got images to build the Wi-Fi radio um, already installed or already uploaded. So you can actually just connect to my website. You don't have to cross-compile it, although I highly recommend that you do so you can control what packages get compiled, which is super useful. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reboot because I'm lazy. And what this should do is whenever it comes back up, um, I'm going to take this hub that's actually got a USB to audio adapter on it, and it's got a USB storage. Uh, is there a question back there?
That's correct. I've looked and looked and looked, and I can't find it. Um, if you find it, definitely let me know. Um, I actually like searched the entire printed circuit board trying to find where that second USB hub is, um, or port is, and I couldn't find it. Um, it's there somewhere. It's possible that it comes out on the back of, back of the CPU and then it just doesn't have a trace connected to it. It's also possible that there's like a little test point or something and just that I missed it whenever I was looking for it. There's also supposed to be two serial ports and I've only found one. Um, there should be a second serial port somewhere, but I think the problem is that Asus didn't think that they needed it so they didn't bring it out on the printed circuit board, which is a real drag, but you know, that's just the, the way that it is. Um, so now it's booted and I've connected my hub which has my uh, mass storage device as well as uh, my USB to audio. Um, and I'm actually going to connect a cable to the USB audio. I've got the laptop set up for pass through so we should be able to hear um, what's going on on the, the router. Um, so now I'm back in again and what I want to do now is basically um, make a place to mount the USB drive and I'm just going to mount it. So now if this worked, yeah, so this is actually what's on the um, USB mass storage or the memory stick. Um, so that's cool, um, but now, you know, what am I gonna do? So I see I've got a SID file there, so, you know, I, I wonder what that is. Um, so I wanna install maybe a SID player would be cool. Um, so I update the list of packages. Whenever you reboot, it loses its cache of where the packages are, so you have to do O package update. Um, so how about I install, um, now this needs P thread. But I've got tiny SID, which is a tiny little SID player um, that I actually cross compiled myself, which forced me to learn how to do that, which was not super traumatic, but a little bit less than straightforward. The openwrt.org website has how to cross compile packages. Um, so you see it's installed. And actually, if we check right now, you can see that the, the flash is only 30% used. So we can put all sorts of other stuff on there. Four megs actually holds quite a lot of stuff if your stuff is very small. <laughs> Um, so now I've got a, a SID player. So now what I should be able to do, and um, I'm gonna lower the levels here because this can be quite loud. So there we go. So there, now the router is actually playing off the USB memory stick through the USB to audio converter using the hub because it's only got one USB port but I just bought a cheap hub. Um, it's actually playing a SID because I cross compiled a SID player for it. Um, which, whenever I got this to work, I thought that's pretty cool because this means that I can basically cross compile all sorts of stuff that uses OSS audio um, and run it on the router. And as long as it's pretty lightweight, it should work. Um, so I thought that was cool. So then, um, how are we doing on time? We've got 15 minutes. I want to leave a little bit of time for questions, but I also want to do something that actually shows the Wi Fi capability of the router. Um, so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to connect to the um, Nauticon network, and then I'll, I'm sure I'll get hacked instantly after I do that. Um, but actually, yeah, in, in, to, in order to discourage that, I'm gonna set a password. <laughs> there, so now there's a weak password. You have you know, 20 minutes to hack me. Um, so hopefully, this worked last night, and I don't know why you have to specify the channel number, but basically this is all in Etsy uh, config. Uh, you have to enable the wireless. If you go over here, um, I'm going to put it on the wide area network. Uh, station mode, so it's just going to connect. And let's see if this works. Uh, so if this works, um, if we're lucky, we should be connected to Wi-Fi. And there's actually an LED on the printed circuit board that'll turn on to tell us if we are. So hopefully the Nauticon network is working in this room. And it is, because I just saw the light turn on. So, oops. Let's just look back here. Yeah, so now we're connected to the network. So that was pretty easy, right? So now the network's actually connected to the Nauticon network um, and we're able to talk to the outside world. Um, so what would be really cool would be if I could show you um, some streaming radio. So I'm going to install MPC and MPD, which are, you know, Linux. Um, uh, MPD is a music player daemon, can connect to either files or MP3 radio streams and plays music. MPC is a command line client for it. Um, and the only issue I've had is that the more recent versions of MPD are really bloated. Um, 
I actually am using 0 0.13, 0 0.2. If 0.14 and like 0.15 beta rely on like all these crazy libraries and I, I, it actually fills up the flash on the router. So in some cases, you may wanna like go get your own older versions of utilities or like strip them down, get rid of a lot of fat because like MPC got, or MPD got huge in some of the recent releases. Um, so then I just need to do a couple things to satisfy um, MPD so that it doesn't complain at me whenever I try to launch it. Um, and then I just need to edit the configuration file. Um, and actually, I need to Check, check. All right, cool. Um, so what I did is I edited the configuration file for MPD. I told it that we're using OSS and we need to use dev sound DSP and hopefully this will work. So I just start MPD. It complains about not having a DB file, which I really don't care about. Um, and now what I'm gonna do is type one-handed and I'm gonna add um, a radio stream. So this is the uh, URL to a uh, uh, Slay Radio, um, and if I'm lucky, so that just added it to uh, MPD's database of songs, um, and I should be able to just start playing. Um, so it's connecting right now. There we go. So in what, like 15, less than, no, like 10 minutes, we have a Wi-Fi radio, you know? So it's actually connecting uh, the laptop's not required. I could actually disconnect all the lines. I'm using the laptop to pass through the audio just to make it easy so I don't have to connect cables around. But basically, the router is actually connecting to the Nauticon network over Wi-Fi using MPD um, to connect to a streaming radio station, Slay Radio. Um, and then I'm using MPC to control it. And it required like almost no work on my part, right? I just used existing utilities. Um, I didn't do anything too crazy, uh, and it, you know, there we go, so we're up and running. First, we're, we're skipping like hell because someone's probably throttling the network, but, um, and you can actually see what song is playing. Um, you can connect to, you know, Digitally Imported is one of my favorites, really high quality, and it'll play all their high quality streams too. Um, so this, this works, you know, if you just want to do a quick project like this, this is, is perfect. Um, so I just had one more slide. So I'm just gonna skip through a couple of these. Do, do, do. We, we talked about all this stuff. Um, I'm gonna put the slides on my website. So if you wanna read about some of the other stuff. Um, yeah, so here they are. So basically, the Wi-Fi radio project was mine, and I actually have a tutorial on my website that t walks you through the whole process of installing the serial port, um, installing OpenWRT on the router, configuring it. I've got all the shell scripts to drive the LCD display. You know, if you're into electronics, I've got the schematics to build the LCD um, display and, and also the tuning control and all that stuff is all on my website. So if you go to mightyhome.com slash Wi-Fi radio, um, there's tons of pictures, you know, there's forums. So if you want to ask questions, you can go to the Wi-Fi radio forum. Uh, there's a bunch of people on there that are doing cool stuff. You know, just people are doing all sorts of stuff like the tweet a lot, you know, the RSS reader. Um, if you want to contact me, you can go to the go to my blog and just look for the contact link. Um, and I also started a Flickr group for people that are doing cool stuff with the router. So if you do do a cool project, um, not only should you go to my forum and talk about it on the forum, um, but you know post your photos because there's a lot of people who are interested in this stuff. Um, and I think there's a good opportunity for people to kind of be inspired by what other people are doing. Because uh, as I showed, like in in definitely in a, in a weekend or even a weekend afternoon, you could have something basically working. So uh, that's it for the talk. So I guess we have a few minutes for Q&A.
Yes. Are there any GPIO lines on the board and kind of related, can you control the LEDs from software? Absolutely, yeah, and, and I have not done it, but that's a very common thing that you would use OpenWRT to do. Um, there's at least one person on the blog who has done that, and I don't know that there's a ton of GPIO available outside of the LEDs, so you may just be limited to the seven LEDs that are on, on the front. It's probably an eight bit, well, who knows? I guess there could be as many GPIOs as, as they wanted, but, um, there is uh, built-in OpenWRT support to talk to the LEDs. I think they're a Linux device, so you could probably just cat something to a file system node and it should be able to control the LEDs. Um, but I haven't done it myself. Have you tried to do anything like make this be a Kismet drone and run it off of an external like battery pack? If so, about what sort of life can you expect to have with one of these? Um, well, it, it depends on your battery. Um, I, I haven't measured the current consumption, but I've been told it's five volts at around 200 milliamps, which is pretty low. So you should be able to run this on like a gel cell with a step-down converter if your DC to DC is pretty efficient for hours and hours and hours. I mean, there's even somebody who's looking at using solar to power this. Um, so, so like some of the stranger things I've seen on my blog and on the forums is um, somebody's looking at doing this using solar power, putting this on a rooftop. I've also talked to someone who's thinking about putting this into their R2-D2 robot um, to use to stream audio and collect data back from the robot. Um, because they're so low power and they're so small that you can put them into stuff. Um, so yeah, that, that shouldn't be any problem at all. There, there's definitely, there, yeah, so the question was, uh, you, could you put a webcam on it? And yeah, um, I, again, I haven't messed with that, but uh, there are Linux drivers. Um, people are putting webcams on some of the more powerful routers that have USB. And actually, one thing I should mention is that if you don't like this router, I can't imagine why you wouldn't, but if you need USB 2.0 support especially, um, I've heard that the Asus WL500 uh, GP version 2, it's about... Uh, maybe one and a half times the size of this. It has two USB 2.0 ports. It's got, I think, twice the flash and twice the RAM, uh, about the same CPU. But basically, if you spend the extra 20 or $30, you get a more powerful router. So you can kind of take your pick. On the slide where you had the um, serial port, there yeah. was what looks like a configuration jumper, and it looked like the one that didn't, that wasn't jumped, was the GP fifty. Well, whatever. that's actually not true. Um, okay. The the jumper that, is yeah. because there's an even cheaper version of this router, and I didn't know if I was going to have time to talk about this, but I've I've never actually seen one of these in the wild. I don't know if anyone's actually bought one, but the same router is available without the print server support from the factory, so you can get the WL five twenty GC. It has no USB. Um, if you look at the printed circuit board, and you're welcome to, to look at this later, um, it actually has <laughs> both routers' part numbers are on the printed circuit board. And there's a little jumper that tells it if it's a 520GU or a 520GC. So actually, you could spend, if you're a real cheapskate, <laughs> if you could spend $20 less. Um, I looked this. You can buy these on Newegg. I think they're about $39, something like that. Um, for the GC, and there's a little list, like they've been super helpful. There's actually a little list on the bottom of the printed circuit board that tells you what parts you have to buy to turn it from the GC into the GU, which like, I, I just want to write Asus and thank them because they've been so helpful to us. Like they made the serial port super easy to get to, um, and they made it so that we can turn a GC into a GU. Um, I'm not going to do this because I'm not, I'm not that cheap to actually do that, but if, if someone here does, please like write about it and let me know because I would love to show that on my blog. Basically just say, you can buy like the cheapest Asus router that they probably have right now um, and you can, you can add USB to it because it's all already there um, and you can turn it into a, a GU. Um, the GPV2, the WL500 GPV2 is a much larger printed circuit board and, and that's something, that's a different beast. It actually has a USB hub controller on the printed circuit board. I have some of those too but I didn't bring one. Uh, have you, or do you know anybody who's run an Asterisk server off of this to run a phone stuff? I don't know of anyone, but I know that there's considerable interest in the wireless router hacking community to do that, because obviously that would be a pretty cool thing. 
Um, I would I would play with it. I mean, I, I my scope really for packing the router was I wanted to make the Wi-Fi radio. And whenever I published the, how to do it, a lot of other people read my tutorials and basically used that to make their own stuff. So what I would do is, if you're interested in it, just go to my site, you know, figure out how to flash the router and just start playing with it. The thing to see would be if someone has ported asterisk to OpenWRT. If that's happened, then there shouldn't be any reason why you couldn't make it work. All right, so I guess we're out of time, but uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. <laughs>